This special series is produced by AGS Media for teachers and parents to help them guide kids to choose responsible behavior. Responsible kids in school and at home, the cooperative discipline way. Welcome to the third program in our six-part series, Let's Fight Power Struggles. At our anchor desk is Pearl Kemp and Tom Luce, with reporter Clint Camamont and special guest, author, teacher, and parent, Dr. Linda Albert. Discipline is the process by which we teach children to choose responsible behavior. In program one of this series, we learn from experts who use the cooperative discipline approach to dealing with kids that behavior is based on choice. We found that one way to influence kids to make responsible choices is to use the hands-joined style of discipline, where the adult functions as a guide and a leader rather than as a drill sergeant who commands and demands instant compliance. We also learned that encouragement is the most powerful discipline tools adults have. It's the process by which teachers and parents help kids find appropriate ways to satisfy their need to belong, to feel capable, connected, and contributing. Kids make poor choices of behavior when they can't satisfy their need to belong in positive ways. In our last video, we focused on attention-seeking behavior. In this video, we'll take a look at power behavior. We'll see examples of what this behavior looks like in school and at home, examine the clues for identifying power behavior, learn strategies for preventing it, and, most important of all, find out what to do when kids choose power behavior. We ask kids, what do you do when you want to show your power? To show that you're in control and nobody can make you do something you don't want to. I just argue and say, I'm not going to do it. Watch. Your assignment is to prepare a written report on this experiment, and it's due on Monday. No way! Mr. Prince doesn't make his class turn in written assignments. You don't have the right to make us do more work than his class. You're not being fair, and I'm not going to do it. We've just seen the school version of the I'm going to get my own way temper tantrum. At school, kids use words to get control. At home, they may use words, or they may try kicking, screaming, or crying. Kids don't lose their temper. They know exactly where it is at all times. Unfortunately, they use, not lose their temper. Kids use it as a weapon to try to force the adults to give in to their demands or to get the adult to back off when they don't want to do something. When kids engage adults in power struggles, it's like the kids are dangling a fish hook in front of us. The challenging words they say is the bait. They're itching for us to bite and start arguing back. If we don't bite the hook the first time it's thrown at us, they change the bait and dangle it in front of us again, and again, and again. When adults take the bait, they almost always lose. After all, it's the kid who decides when and where to go fishing and who will be watching and how to reel the adult fish in. Not taking the bait, refusing to be drawn into the power struggle by fighting back, doesn't mean letting the kids get away with misbehaving. It just means that the adult remains in control of the situation and uses strategies more effective than fighting back. Let's see another power move. We call it the last word syndrome. I keep on bugging and bugging them until they give in. Watch. Janetta, you know your written work isn't finished, and our rule is you don't use the computer till after your written work is finished. If I take the time to finish it, the bell will ring before I get a chance. The rule is that written assignments are to be finished before you can use the computer. Please go back to your seat and get to work. But then I won't have time to finish the program I'm playing. It's more important than your dumb assignment anyway. Then you'll just have to wait until tomorrow to use the computer. If you just pay attention and get your work done, then you can have a chance to use the computer. Yesterday, you let Melanie go back there, and she didn't finish her seat work first. I had my reasons. If you'd stop arguing and get to work, maybe you'd have some time on the computer before the bell rings. But you're not being fair. I promise if you let me use the computer now, I'll finish my assignments first tomorrow. 
The last word syndrome is another version of a verbal temper tantrum. Kids use words as their weapons. They try to out-reason, out-justify, out-argue adults, even make promises that experience tells us they have no intention of keeping, just so they can get their own way. Instead of seeing this behavior for what it is, a deliberate power struggle initiated by the child, adults often label the child stubborn or strong-willed, as if the behavior represented a personality trait rather than a chosen behavior. Kids at home know how to engage parents in power struggles, too. I talk my way out of stuff. Sometimes I just forget. Sort of. I tell them what they want to hear, and I make a sound real good. Then I do what I want it anyway. We know that the goal of misbehavior can be for attention, power, revenge, or avoidance of failure. It's important to identify the goal in order to know how to intervene effectively. Different strategies work with different goals. We know that one clue for attention-seeking behavior is a reading of mild on our emotional pressure gauge. When we find ourselves in a power struggle, our emotional pressure gauge rises to a reading of hot. We feel angry, frustrated, and perhaps even fearful of losing control of the situation and of the class. A typical impulsive reaction when we're in a power struggle is to try to regain control by fighting back with words. Don't you dare argue with me. You'll do it because I say so now. Sometimes when our emotions get the best of us, we fight with sarcastic, humiliating, esteem-crushing remarks, words that we're sorry for as soon as they leave our lips. Unfortunately, when we fight with words and use our power to overpower the kid, we risk escalating the incident into revenge behaviors, with the kid vowing to get even with us later. Another impulsive reaction is to give up and give in. I give up. Go on to the computer now so the rest of the class can finish their work and not have to put up with your outburst anymore. Our last clue for identifying power behavior is to look at the kid's response to correction. Power behavior doesn't stop as quickly or as easily as attention-getting behavior. After all, the kids are trying to show us they're the boss and they'll do things their way. So the misbehavior doesn't stop until somehow it stops on the kids' terms, not ours. For example, numbers that you are used to adding, 3 plus 2 will equal 5. Then you will start with a negative integer, add it to a negative integer, you will get a negative number. Tony, please stop tapping your pencil. You multiply a positive number times a positive number and you will get a positive answer. When you multiply a negative number, by a negative number, you will get a positive answer. The only time you will get a negative answer when you're multiplying integers is when you have one of each. When you multiply, Tony, I ask you to please sit down so I can continue with the lesson. Remember, when you multiply a positive I'm going, number I'm going. times a positive number, Tony, I ask you to please sit down so I can continue with the lesson. I'm going, I'm going. <laughs> what did you say, Tony? I didn't hear that last remark. Let's review what we've said about the clues to identifying power behavior. Ask yourself these questions when faced with a misbehaving child. Do I feel angry or frustrated? Is my impulse to respond by fighting back or by giving in? When I do respond, does the misbehavior continue until it stops on the kid's terms? If I can answer yes to these questions, the misbehavior is probably for power. In our studio with Clint Camelmont today is Dr. Linda Albert. She developed the cooperative discipline approach that our Responsible Kids series is based upon. When I was a student, we wouldn't dare talk back to a teacher. Unfortunately, kids don't live in a vacuum. The choices they make reflect what they see and hear all around them. 
and they see and hear a lot of disrespect for authority modeled by adults and glorified on the screen. You know, I cringe when I think of kids baiting a teacher or a parent with a fish hook. It's helpful to look beyond the hook to some legitimate needs. It's developmentally appropriate for kids to learn to think for themselves, decide for themselves, and even begin to take charge of their lives, especially as they progress into adolescence. The problem comes when kids confuse where it's legitimate for them to be in control and make decisions and where they're stepping on our toes. The adult's job is to set limits and help kids learn the boundaries. Can we prevent power struggles from occurring and still respect the child's need for personal power? To some extent, it's possible. We can grant kids as much legitimate power as possible. We can give limited choices within parameters set by adults. We can also seek student input into decisions that affect them whenever possible. Well, what part does the reading of hot on our emotional pressure gauge play in dealing with or preventing power struggles? It's a warning for us to cool down. Heated reactions actually reinforce power behavior. It's proof to kids that they're so powerful they can make adults get angry. So we remove the payoff by responding calmly and rationally in a business-like manner at the moment of misbehavior. And then later, when we're alone, we allow ourselves to open the valve and let off steam in ways that don't injure a child or ourselves. Well, thank you, Dr. Albert. And now we're going to go back to the anchor desk and talk about some intervention strategies in dealing with power behavior. Thanks, Clint. Let's see how the science teacher we met earlier uses a set of skills known as graceful exits to put an end to a power struggle that's disrupting his classroom. Your assignment is to prepare a written report on this experiment, and it's due on Monday. No way! Mr. Prince doesn't make his class turn in written assignments. You don't have the right to make us do more work than his class. You're not being fair, and I'm not going to do it. Hmm. Anne has baited the hook. She'd like me to stop what I'm doing and argue about fairness. I used to do that. Let's see what happens when I use a graceful exit instead. You're absolutely right, Anne. I am assigning more work than Mr. Prince, and the assignment's due on Monday. This teacher used a graceful exit called fogging. He simply agreed with what Anne said. How can you continue to argue with someone who is agreeing with you? Another graceful exit this teacher could have used is a simple to me, to you statement. Watch. To you, Anne, this assignment seems unfair, but to me it's an important part of the learning process. It's due on Monday. The to you, to me statement lets kids feel heard, but allows the teacher to respectfully disagree with their opinion. A third graceful exit that this science teacher could use is to table the matter and make an appointment to discuss it at another time. And I'm not willing to discuss this with you at this time. Here's a schedule of the hours that I'm available to talk with the students. Please schedule an appointment and on the second page, in a few words, express your concerns about the assignment, its fairness or its unfairness. I'm looking forward to talking with you about it then. Suppose Anne continues to resist and says, Well, I still think this assignment's unfair and you can't make me do it. You're right, Anne. I can't make you do it, but the assignment needs to be written and turned in on Monday. This graceful exit is called acknowledge their power. In truth, a teacher can't make a student think and write. Often when a student is into a power play, that's all they want to hear. Once they see that the teacher can't make them do something, students often turn around and do the very task they were arguing about a moment before. Which graceful exit a teacher chooses is left up to his or her professional judgment. They've all been used effectively with kids from kindergarten to 12th grade. Of course, it takes a great deal of teacher control not to bite the hook, especially when students are disrespectful and exhibit the last word syndrome. Remember Janetta? Yesterday you let Melanie go to the computer and she didn't finish her seat work first. I wonder if the Mets are going to win their game today. Didn't you hear what I just said? Yesterday you let Melanie go back there and she didn't finish her seat work first. I'll bet we're going to get quite a storm this afternoon. This teacher has used a graceful exit called change the subject. 
Now, perhaps it seems rude to you that the teacher doesn't answer Janetta directly, but authorities tell us that it is polite to refuse to respond to an inappropriate statement, especially when asked in an inappropriate manner at an inappropriate time. If Janetta has a legitimate concern about the use of the computer in the classroom, rather than starting a power struggle, she can always talk to the teacher in appropriate ways at appropriate times without disrupting her classmates. Removing the audience is another graceful exit teachers can use. Of course, we can't send all the kids out of the room while we deal with a power-hungry student, but we can remove them psychologically. Yesterday, you let Melanie go to the computer and she didn't finish her seat work first. Okay, gang, remember I told you that we were going to have a computer expert visit our classroom? You may be wondering, why can't the teacher just say, be quiet, write her name on the board, or threaten this student with detention if she keeps arguing? If our goal is to influence the choices kids make and to help them learn to become responsible, experience tells us that graceful exits are more effective teaching tools than threats and punishments. Notice the teachers didn't chastise the students for their inappropriate behavior when it occurred. There's always a time later, such as during an individual conference or a class meeting, to talk about the effect of students' behavior has on the teacher, the class, and on the student's own learning. While the student has the fishing pole in hand trying to hook you, however, the less said, the sooner the pole will get put away. Graceful exits work equally well at home when kids are baiting their parents. All the other kids I know get more allowance than me. You're not fair. You're right. I'm not fair. Dad, why did you get pizza with vegetables on it? I really can't stand this yucky stuff. You know, it's really dry. I hope our garden gets some rain tonight. It's stupid it does. It only get dust again tomorrow. To you, it may be a waste of time. To me, it's important, so I'll expect it to be done before you turn on the TV. Why can't I stay out late? All the other kids my age do. I'm not willing to discuss a later curfew right now. You can put your concerns on the agenda for the family meeting on Thursday, okay? Fogging, to you, to me statements, Tabling the matter, making an appointment for a later discussion, changing the subject, removing the audience psychologically, all different ways teachers and parents can attempt to stop a power struggle in its incipient stages. Sometimes, however, power struggles do escalate, despite the adult's best efforts. When that happens, we need to use the timeout and consequence strategies. We'll be focusing on these in the next program when we talk about revenge behavior. Thanks for joining us, and we'll look forward to seeing you then.